And the very first item on the work session today, the executive session, I need to get a motion to go in the executive session to consider a matter that concerns proposal for a business or industrial organization to locate, expand, and remain, remain in the state. So moved. Emily moved. Shelley second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion. Anybody, anybody opposed? Motion carries 5 0. We're in executive session. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, first item on the work session is a proclamation for Forget Me Not Month. Uh, J.R. Arnold is here from the Disabled American Veterans Organization to accept the proclamation. J.R., can you come up to the center? All right, so uh, the proclamation is Forget Me Not Month, September 2020, and it reads, whereas the Disabled American Veterans Organization offers a variety of free services to disabled veterans and their families, and whereas each year the Disabled American Veterans Organization both the Forget Me Not Drive, where all proceeds raised are given to those disabled veterans and their families who are in need. And whereas the city of Hagerstown expresses her gratitude to those disabled veterans who valiantly fought to protect our freedom and preserve our way of life. Now therefore be resolved with the support of the city council, I, Robert E. Bruchy II, mayor of the city of Hagerstown, Maryland, to hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 as Forget Me Not Month and encourage our citizens to support the Forget Me Not Drive which supports our local disabled veterans and their families. Uh, no, we just thanks. Uh, we appreciate it and have a chance to collect some money that we can pass out to deserving people. And uh, we like to do it every year, month of September. This month, this year is going to be hard because we've lost a lot of our places that we used to sit in front. But uh, we'll make it go. I'm sure you will. You're. Uh you're definitely an aggressive individual. Yeah. I've known you for a long time. Yes, sir. I think uh, thank you for having us here, and thank you for the proclamation. And uh, yeah, it's our sad thing is that we can't uh, help everybody this year do the COVID-19, and we're always looking for better for futures for next year. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Town Youth Advisory Council annual report. Good afternoon. So we are here just to provide a brief overview of the first year of the Youth Advisory Council. 
Um, just before I introduce our youth, we're going to provide you a brief, a brief uh, PowerPoint on this. Just wanted to say that you know both myself and Jonathan very much enjoyed working with the youth during this initiative and our adult partner group, and we are very excited for our next cohort who will begin at the end of this month. So I'm going to welcome up two of our students, Lauren Asbury and Kevin Bocum, who are going to give you a presentation. the Youth Advisory Council. My name is Lauren Asbury, and I was the chair this year. And I'll let Kevin introduce himself. Hey guys, my name is Kevin Bocum, and I'm a member of the Hagerstown Youth Advisory Council. Yes, so pretty much today, we're just going to cover what we've done, what we hope to do in the future, and pretty much just providing an overview of what our first year looked like. So we have prepared an agenda for you today. So first we will discuss who we are and what we're doing here today, and then we will discuss our accomplishments, and then we will discuss the lessons we've learned along this first year, and then we'll give acknowledgments to the people who've helped us along the way. So here's the introduction. Okay, our purpose. The Hagerstown Youth Advisory Council was established by the Hagerstown Mayor and City Council to give Hagerstown youth the opportunity to provide feedback and recommendations regarding the community policies and programs that affect their future and take a leadership role in creating meaningful change. This is the, pur this is the purpose that's defined us along this year. Yeah, so overall, just our purpose is to be advisory. And we've, hi Maya, come take a seat. <laughs> Like, I'll let you finish up your slide yeah. here, if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, I mean, not really. Uh, I think they probably both mentioned how our purpose is ever-changing, and mm -hmm. as a council, and as we get new members in each cohort, we will evolve. So some of our so, goals. This <laughs> some of our goals for this year is, uh, or some of our goals overall as we meet, is we try to meet twice a month in the bureau box to discuss issues that we're passionate about. So we came across, of course, we mentioned this at our council update in January. But our three main issues that we're passionate about are the environment, wellness in a physical and mental sense, and financial literacy. So overall, within our um, initiatives in the council, we tried to plan events and overall just ways to get involved with these three issues um, to sort of inform ourselves on what we're passionate about so we make sure we're making the best choices that we can. We invite members of the community, city officials, and nonprofit leaders that know a lot about these subjects so that way we are well informed to act on them. And we overall like to also, since we are the Youth Advisory Council, maintain a social media presence on Instagram and Facebook so that way we can stay current and stay in touch with um, other members of the youth community and figure out what they want to see. So some of the groups we've met with along this, during this year is we met with our city engineer, Roddy Tissue. We've met with Parks and Rec. We've met with Artists Rally to Stand. We've met with the Hagerstown PD. We've met with Reach of Washington County. And we've met with Horizon Goodwill. Uh, outreach. So we actually do not just have members come in to speak with us. We have uh, reached out to many local organizations as well, and we've done presentations very similar to this. Uh, we've reached out to the Kiwanis Club and the Sunshine Rotary Club, and it really is a great experience for us because we're trying to get the word out there as much as we want people to hear about what we do. So it really is a good opportunity for us to just basically say what we're all about. And we overall, it's just really nice to be able to communicate with people and tell them ourselves what we're about instead of them just reading about it or hearing about it. We get to sort of represent ourselves and put ourselves forward, which is always a great opportunity. So in terms of the structure of our meetings, um, we decided to create subcommittees to focus directly on our main initiatives. So of course, that will be the environment. Since it's important to us to have a clean and stable community, this subcommittee focuses, and we'll go more into direct initiatives a little bit later. Um, financial literacy, we, wanted, we used a lot of social media content for this, spreading information that may be less accessible to members of the community, sort of just giving quick tips, maybe information about loans, information about savings accounts, just different ways to show people things that they should know about. And in wellness, we wanted to promote physical and mental health awareness. 
One of the main things that drives our meetings is teamwork. Here you can see a picture of all of us working in our subcommittees to plan different initiatives. And teamwork is really essential to what we're doing. Uh, we've actually, um, as much as we've been stopped by the current situation, we actually have made quite a few accomplishments and we're going to share a few of them with you guys. So looking directly, like I mentioned before, our environment initiatives, we planned this large event that we were sort of going to refer to as Earth Day event or Hagerstown Hugs Earth. So our goal was to celebrate the city that we're in and to sort of bring attention to the beauty that we have here. So in terms of partnership, we met with the Parks and Rec of Hagerstown, it's like I mentioned before, to sort of amp up their Earth Day event and bring more of a youth appeal to it. Um, due to the coronavirus, of course, we had to cancel it or postpone it, hopefully, to the next year. And we definitely hope that the incoming cohort finds a lot of passion in this area, as we did, and that they will choose to go forward and make it bigger and better. Oh, this is uh, and the City Tree is some, it's a project that I was with uh, one of our other members, Zach. And it was a really interesting, because we had never been to the farm where the city uh, picks out the tree. And it was really great to, first of all, see a local business that grows Christmas trees. And second of all, it was really great to be a part of something that's such a hallmark of the community. This lighting of the city tree is such a big event. And it felt really good to, you know, be a part of that. And I thought it was a really fun idea. We had a really good time. Uh, and yeah. Since we use so much social media during for our council, we make sure to post our members' accomplishments to to highlight what they, what we've been doing. Since we like to form a community aspect, not just because we're a council, but because we also try to work together as a team and as a family. So, for example, here's a picture of me that your science advisory council posted, <laughs> and yeah. And uh, this has been mainly one of the other members' projects, Zach Brooks, but he's been really great about uh, our social media appearance and keeping it very consistent. Uh, we have, of course, three different subcommittees, the Environment, Financial Literacy, and Wellness, and we use our, the story feature on Instagram in order to post you know, palatable information, especially that correlates with the posts that we're doing. Uh, and we have, of course, access to all of our agendas from our Instagram page. and. We share it on both Instagram and Facebook. It gives us a little bit of variety to reach different audiences. So, of course, oh, many of our initiatives were sort of paused due to the coronavirus, but instead of just not meeting at all, we began meeting over Zoom. So instead of focusing on the in-person initiatives, we started turning more towards senior recognition and ways to sort of bring attention to a lot of things that were lost and how we can still look positively at accomplishments of seniors. So we continue to, ha we continued even up to now to have hybrid meetings um, in person at the Bureau Box and some people joined over Zoom. And that was really beneficial because even um, people that were comfortable to come, they still had the opportunity to be present even if they physically couldn't be here. So if someone was on vacation, like when Zach was in va on vacation in Georgia, he was still able to join us, which is a really unique way for us to still come together as a council. And uh, this is an example of one of our Instagram posts that we do. This is from one of the subcommittees uh, that I was on. It was from the Financial Literacy Subcommittee. And all of these graphics are made using the online software Canva. And basically what we do is we look for different sources that we feel would be beneficial for the community and serve it to at least the youth in a palatable way. Because sometimes, especially financial literacy information, can be really draining, really dull. And this gives it in a very palatable form so people that are interested can learn more about it. And yeah, that's basically it. So right here, we had uh, uh, our meeting with the Hagerstown PD. And during this meeting, we talked about the different initiatives Hagerstown PD was taking on. And we also talked about how the Hagerstown PD is interacting with our community and what we can do to help with it. And also, they also gave us updates on what they were doing. And we really felt inclined to have this meeting because of all the and justice is going on right now in the large outpour and outrage. So we thought it would be very beneficial to have us communicate. And it was really great to have the opportunity to just ask our questions and ask what was on our mind, of course in a respectful manner, to be able to get answers that we were looking for. So this again shows that as a council, we're really looking for different perspectives and ways to inform ourselves more on the issues that we're passionate about. 
So now we're going to head into sort of what we've learned and what we hope to accomplish in the next coming year. So this year, as we stated earlier, we've been able to advise multiple city departments, nonprofits, and community organizations whose work somehow involves Hagerstown youth. So this year was a lot of acclimation and sort of getting ourselves familiar with how we want to run and um, the way that we want to contribute to our community. And looking into the future, we would like to have more of a direct advisory role to the mayor and council regarding current community projects that involved and affect youth. So rather than going to um, merely side organizations or nonprofits, absolutely, we hope to continue to do that. But we definitely look forward to maintaining more direct communication. So looking into applications for this, um, we're thinking of ways to um, manifest this direct communication, and our idea was biannual co-council meetings. So of course we did have our update in January, but we were thinking more of a direct conversation to talk about our goals more regularly and communicate um, how we can achieve a mutual interest sort of just being more directly advisatory and more frequently advisatory so we um, work together. And we're just looking for, of course, more ideas on how to forge a more collaborative relationship. And we really look forward to seeing what this looks like in the coming year. And uh, as somebody who is gonna be serving on the cohort next year, uh, we are really looking forward to the incoming cohort. We have some voting members and some non-voting members joining us next year. And I think having a lot of these fresh people and fresh ideas is gonna be really great because now we kind of have a foundational basis set. Uh, I kind of referred to it in one of our meetings as our George Washington year, where George Washington set a lot of precedent for the American uh, government. And now we set a lot of precedent for what each yak will look like moving forward. And I think now that we're bringing new members in, we're gonna have a lot of great ideas and hopefully a lot of ways to do it. So now we like to give our acknowledgements So first, we have to thank our supporters. So first, we have to thank our city staff, Lauren Metz and Jonathan Kearns from the Department of Community and Economic Development. And we also like to thank our adult partner group that has helped us and guide us along the way. And these are members from our community. And we'd also really like to thank our senior members, like Lauren herself. <laughs> uh, the senior members have been really great because of course we selected people from all different age levels and having senior members here allowed us to um, get a different perspective. And also, senior members did not get a lot of the recognition that they deserved this year because of the pandemic. So it was really great to be able to appreciate the um, seniors through us. And a lot of them served as officers since they had a one-year term. So they were really important members in a lot of our activities. And moving into some further recognition, we would like to acknowledge Shelley McIntyre, our council liaison. We really um, appreciated your time that you contributed to coming to our meetings and being directly um, communicative with us and taking us to the Rotary meeting and just allowing us to really voice for ourselves. We really appreciate that and we definitely wouldn't be here without your support. So thank you very much and thank you to the City Council as a whole. So we wanted to move into if anyone has any questions or anything you'd like to know about the Council, the future for the Council, just anything. What kind of uh, a feedback do you get from uh, your peers? Um, are, are they, are, is there a, a good deal of interest in, in what you're doing and, and desire to participate? Well, we've actually gained a pretty substantial social media following for in a local sense. And we had a member of our community, her name is Cottrell, is that correct? Um, she um, was involved with the local sort of artist, artist rally to stand. We mentioned that on a slide. And she reached out to us to communicate her initiatives and her endeavors. So it just it's given other um, youth the opportunity to express themselves and to be more engaged with their community. So we've really found, um, and of course we've had um, um, nonprofits and large organizations reach out to us. So we have had both youth engagement and adult engagement, and it's a really great opportunity to find a way to bridge the gap of communication. Did you guys have anything to add to that? Uh, no, other than uh, a lot of the, our work has been through social media, especially since we haven't been able to do a lot of face-to-face -face contact, obviously. So, um, you know, we still, for doing mostly social media initiatives, had like, I believe it was 10 applicants 
for the new cycle of people and we accepted a good portion of them onto the council in replacing our senior members. But it was a pretty decent amount. Our involvement's pretty good. Good. So it's given you a platform, a given other youth a platform to be able to come to you with their ideas and, mm -hmm. and then you can mm -hmm. pass them by your liaison and, and, and the senior members that are. Right. Yeah. And that's really important to us because we are, of course, representing the youth of our community. So it's really great that pe these uh, our fellow youth feel the comfort to come to us to sort of share the things that they're passionate about. Good. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of our members, we go to different schools in Hagerstown, so we come from different diverse backgrounds, which allows us to better communicate the interests of those youth to to our platforms, such as Instagram, as you see through our stories, and also to communicate towards different city initiatives. So I just want to definitely um, give a giant thank you to both Jonathan and Lauren, because they are simply amazing and work so well um, in communication, and I, you know, hats off to you for sure. Um, each, each time I get to show off the Youth Advisory Council to Kiwanis or to the Rotary groups and the other different partners. Um, everyone always comes up to us afterwards and is just so impressed with each one of you and I know that it's been very difficult for everyone to adjust during COVID and, and the new you know, way to communicate and get things done, but the Youth Advisory Council, they are faithful every two weeks and I don't know about you guys but zoom is not my favorite thing in the world but they are just they chat in the middle of conversation you know it's like a it's so dedicated to the city of Hagerstown and getting your message across so I know I say thank you a lot but in this public you know we'll go into the minutes now to let everybody know how proud I am of this organization and for um, for all the hard work that you guys do to better improve the youth voice in our city so thank you yeah. Is that so, it, guys? I'm sorry? Is that it? Yeah, so <laughs> okay. we just want to say thank you so much for your time, yeah. and we thank really you. appreciated this opportunity. Well, thank you very much, yeah. So as I leave this year, I really look forward to seeing what they do, and I'll definitely stick around to see what happens. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you, guys, very much. All right, we have a, uh, a request for exemption from Chapter 155 Noise Ordinance. Carrie Fair from Best of Community Hope. She can't be here uh, this evening, and neither can her supervisor. So um, I, I know that Chief Floor had expressed some concerns about fireworks, uh, but I also know that it, you know we aren't. He's not going to do anything. Doug's not going to do anything until we move past this point. So we need to agree that we would, uh, you know, give an exemption if they can meet all the criteria and safety of, of what uh, our fire marshal, uh, of what our fire marshal needs. Are we okay with that? We're just okaying the noise ordinance. Yeah, I'm okay with the, uh, the, the no noise part of it. I, I do want to, uh, uh, have the discussions with the the fire marshal and the chief. Right, right. Um, but we won't have that until we do this. Right. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, bring up too is I uh, was biking by Fairgrounds Park uh, a couple of weekends ago and ran into uh, Mike there, uh, Kelva, who runs the uh, the softball <coughs> association. And, and one thing we need to do if if this does go off. Um, the day after, if they're doing the mortar type fireworks and everything, we need to police those grounds pretty good because this year on the 4th of July, we moved the firework launching point into the, uh, one of the outfield areas there. And uh, after the 4th of July, uh, one of the, uh, the, the kids that cuts the grass was on a riding mower and uh, ran over some unexpended ordinance that went off. Uh, didn't hurt anybody, didn't do anything, but it could have. Um, so we need to, it, you know, if we do shoot stuff off of the uh, hospital hill there, we need to. Well, I can tell you that every time we had fireworks at Hagerstown Sons, we spent the next three hours cleaning up. Yeah, uh, apparently we didn't do that on the 4th, so. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that's probably the 
the uh, uh, Zambelli who we contracted that with to take care of that. But, the, so, go ahead. The, the only concern I have, uh, I have a comment and concern. The concern I have is the quote that if the shoot proceeds, I believe the Hagerstown Fire Department will need to place additional spotters and pre position units to minimize the risk. I just want to make sure that this is not going to place additional expenses to the city. Uh, if it's going to be overtime, we need, to, we need to have an answer to that. I, I've read the chief's memo. I just want to make sure though, because the chief's memo talks about fireworks that aren't legitimate and talks about the need to have um, people who know what they're doing. My understanding is this is be done by Zambelli, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's what I understand. So we would not be dealing with illegal fireworks or, or people just setting them off. This is a professional show, all right? It's a professional show. And this is gonna be the same kind of exception that we give to the donut drop kind of a, a, an evening where you know it has to be approved by the fire marshal it has to be a plan all those things have to be in place i understand and maybe we could hear from the chief about so council when when that memo was written uh late last friday i had just become aware that uh this was in the works uh, it was undetermined at that time whether it would be professional or just a community right. group that would travel to one of the fireworks shops out of state uh, accumulate uh, uh, their shoot or whatever. Since that time, uh, we've updated and found out that uh, they intend to hire Zambelli, but no application has been made, and that's a two-step process. So uh, Doug's uh, staff has to sign off on the plan, uh, the application, and then ultimately the state fire marshal's office uh, has to approve the shoot, and we're running out of time. Uh, as I sit here today, there is no application process. For this thing so uh, our history with similar type things whether it be the Hagerstown Sons or whoever has been it always went through Kitty Clark's group uh, the logistics involves HPD involves engineering involves uh, Eric Dyke Public Works uh, the fire marshal's office and to the best of my knowledge none of that has been accomplished so I, we're down to just about 30 days I'm not confident we can get it through the state well, that'll be their, their issue, though. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank and, you, and we, we have no, no comment about the uh, noise ordinance. Uh, that's not our... Uh, right, uh, right. But we have to be the ones to waive you. I, I understand. Right. No, I understand now the difference between the, the memo and what we're being yeah. presented with, which is different. Thank you. Okay. So we're all okay with we're all, that. I'm yeah, okay with I'm that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. Next up... Uh, we have the Civil War Rail Trail, Railroad Trail, uh, Chip. Okay, um, good afternoon, um, Mayor Brucci and City Council and City staff and members of the audience. Well, my name is Chip Wood. I'm a retired engineer and I will be assisted by my friend here, Justin Mayhew. He's a guide at Antietam Battlefield, also retired for many years with the Hagerstown Fire Department. Uh, he's my ears because my hearing is not well and if somebody asks me a question I'm kind of lost and he's going to take it and translate it for me. Um, I'm an activist for the Civil War Rail Trail and I have prepared an amiable journey for you today on the rail trail. Uh, the packet 
you councilmen received and the mayor. It's three pieces. Uh, the first three pages here with a map and the explanation is the next page and a list of tour sites. These three pages are the most compact set of information you can get on a rail trail. If you read these three pages, uh, you can learn a lot about the rail trail in a short time. Um, this is eight or nine pages copied from Rail Trail Magazine. It explains about the good fortunes of what's called the Gap. It's the Great Allegheny Passage. It's a rail trail that goes from Cumberland and Allegheny County all the way up to Pittsburgh, and it has transformed the economy and the recreational opportunities uh, between Cumberland and Pittsburgh. There's a lot of uh, good reports and features in here about trails. This third one is 15 pages. It's a report that I did three years ago for the county commissioners, and this explains more history of how the trail came about, how the state purchased it, uh, opposition concerns with the trail and whatever, and this is details uh, to read. And I'll get on with the easy part. Um, there again is a one-page map of the rail trail, and you can see it goes 23 miles, that red line, from the um, city park down to the CNO Canal. Uh, coming out of city park, you go about two miles to uh, Oak Ridge Road, and that two miles is in the Hagerstown city limits. You go three more miles to Roxbury Road, and that is in the county. And those five miles still have active railroad track. There's a train that runs two or three times a week to serve that conservative uh, recycling facility down near, uh, near Rock, uh, Roxbury Road. After that five <coughs> miles, then it's 18 miles to the CNO Canal towpath, and those 18 miles are owned by the state. Uh, DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, and those 18 miles, the tracks have been removed. All right, so now, what is the Civil War Rail Trail? Uh, it accommodates all ages and handicap for walking, bicycling, joggling, joggling, jogging, excuse me, wheelchairing, cross-country skiing. It offers benefits such as health, recreational, educational, cultural, commuting, and tourism. It's a safe place to walk and ride your bike and learn history. Another name would be a family health and recreation trail. And another name would be a history education trail. Because in your th third sheet in this packet with a list of tourist sites, there's 20 tourist sites on the trail that have to do with Civil War or other history. Um, now in the five miles where the active track is, you have what's called a rail with a trail. Uh, there's a train running on a track, and right next to it is a trail. Uh, these work very well in many states. They're safe, and um, you would have this for five miles from City Park to Roxbury Road. Uh, there's a, another a photograph of a rail trail. You can see the paved trail next to the tracks. Uh, now, here's an example of a trail without any railroad, active railroad tracks. This is the Tory Brown Rail Trail in Baltimore County. You can see the mother there doing her morning exercise walk and with her son on his bicycle with his exercise. You can see they're enjoying life and their good health. Um, here's a snapshot of a piece of the Civil War Rail Trail. Uh, here the grass is mowed. That picture was taken three years ago. I don't know what it is today, but at that time, if you stand in the middle of Lappins Road and look south towards the Potomac River, uh, you can see that trail there going into the trees, and it's right next. What happened to my, uh, Right next to Breathedsville Road. Uh, brief history: The State Department of Natural Resources purchased the rail corridor in 1991. The state tried to do a project in 93 and 94. 
but because of protest from the surrounding residents that was stopped. And the county, Washington County, initiated a study for planning for the project in January of 2012, but then the county halted the project six months later because of resident protest and uncertainty on who owns the rail corridor property. Uh, what, why is the rail trail stalled? It's called in a political deadlock between the county and the state. The county will not do something because the state will not do something first and vice versa. In other words, the commissioners will do nothing until the Department of Natural Resources answers these allegations of a faulty deed from the CSX Railroad and DNR will do nothing until the Board of County Commissioners supports the development of the rail trail. Um, now here's some benefits of the rail trail. It's a significant economic catalyst. It would bring bikers, hikers, runners, families, and tourists into the center of the city. This, the Civil Rail Trail complements your com cultural trail um, very well for getting people from, say, the Potomac River, where the towpath is, up into the center of the city. Uh, the county, back in 2012, estimated 200 jobs would be created in the county. They also estimated that the trail would have a $6.4 million positive economic impact, and I think they calculated that before your cultural trail, so now that the cultural trail is there, that number would probably increase. Uh, residential selling point, uh, young professionals and families will view the trail as a significant quality of life bonus right in their backyard. The trail would promote further development and renovation downtown to provide condos, single family residences, restaurants and shops to serve the new res residents and tourists. Uh, Dan Spedden's letter, if you know Dan Spedden, he's the president of County and City Tourism and he wrote this complimentary letter in the back of the report and he talks about how well the trail, trails do re revitalization and uh, increased tourism. Uh, Dine Swan Song, alas, in 2012, all pertinent parties, i.e. the city, Pegerstown, the county commissioners, town of Keatesville, and the state DNR were all firmly behind the rail trail when a small group of landowners claimed the state did not have the legal right to develop the old CSX right of way. And then the Board of County Commissioners suddenly voted to abandon support for reasons that no one has been able to adequately explain. Uh, so all the economic and public health benefits of the trail have been in limbo for eight years due to this unsubstantiated claim that the state does not have legal right to develop the right of way. They're saying the state received a defective deed from the railroad. And so if you look at the economics of this situation, the state paid taxpayers' money, $550,000, to purchase that 18 miles in 1991, and the state could have taken that money and invested it in 3% interest. And have, had they done that, the amount would be about $1.3 million today in the state cash register. Well, guess what? The money's not in the cash register, and we don't have the trail. So, so far, that's $1.3 million wasted, and the interest on that they're paying is $38,000 a year. Now, $38,000 a year would easily pay for the $8,500 cost to research the deeds. I checked with a local Hagerstown, I mean, a county engineering firm, and they said they could check the deeds for $8,500 for when the 1866, the B&O Railroad uh, purchased the land from the people uh, on land on which to build their track. So this is political shenanigans that go on at the uh, high levels. Now look at the trends. The Western Maryland Rail Trail has expanded four times. That's the trail that goes from Clear Spring to Hancock out towards Cumberland. Your city cultural trail is expanding. Apparently the city's had success with it. Uh, county planning and zoning says there's a shortage of walking and jogging area in the county, and they've been saying this uh, before 2012. In 2020, last spring, the county did a survey, and there's 300 people uh, 
want more walking and jogging. Uh, there's potential grants available, uh, bikeways and pedestrian grants. There's a great American Outdoor Act. It was just recently passed and signed by President Trump in the last couple of weeks. This act puts $900 million a year for 10 years in the uh, construction of outdoor recreation such as trails. There's some money, opportunity. Let's get it. Uh, the CNO Canal in Williamsport gets 433,000 visitors. The CNO Canal in Washington County, the CNO Canal in Washington County, there's about 78 miles of CNO Canal towpath in Washington County, and that draws one and a half million visitors. And think of those visitors already in Washington County, they could come right up the rail trail into downtown Hagerstown. Uh, the DNR owned rail trails in Maryland. There's two demonstrated successes. The Torrey C. Brown Rail Trail, 20 miles long in Baltimore County. It saw 467,000 visitors in year 2015. The Western Maryland Rail Trail out here in Hancock and Clear Spring uh, is 27 miles in Washington County, had 150,000 visitors in 2014. Proposed Civil War Rail Trail, 23 miles. Well, we're waiting for that to happen. Now here's some project costs that the county engineering did back in 2012. And they came up with uh, trail construction, about $12 million. Uh, bridges that need to be replaced, a little less than $5 million. Planning and engineering, anyway, the grand total was $18 million. Now, the trail opponents say, that's $18 million, and it's a big waste of money. Well, you have to subtract the grant money you're going to get, also the revenues that the trail's going to produce. So the $18 million isn't just a, a blunt expense. It's going to have a return to it. Uh, the grant funding available, there's many grants. There's the Great American Outdoor Act, which I just talked about, with uh, $900 million a year. There's the Maryland Bikeways Program. There's Transportation Alternatives Program, a Bicycle Pedestrian Preservation Funds, uh, Heart of the Civil War Heritage Area, National Scenic Bikeways Program. Also, private money is available for funding uh, trails. Uh, this is my appeal to the mayor and council. I'm only suggesting one ask at this time, and uh, please not committing any city finances, but the suggestion is for the mayor and council to send a letter of support for the trail to the Board of County Commissioners, the State Department of Natural Resources, and the Governor Hogan, and request the state's formal determination as to whether or not the DNR has legal right to develop the property as originally intended. Uh, that's the end of my amicable journey, and uh, thank you very much. Any questions, uh, Thanks, Chip. I, I think the, um, you know, the, the the question you ask there, I think that just takes uh, a little bit of work on the part of the state to identify uh, who has legal right to that land. It was purchased for, as you said, for $550,000 uh, using public open space funds uh, for the express purpose of making a trail. And having that in the, our city center, the trailhead in the city center, I, I, I've been to rail trails all over the mid-Atlantic area and the trailheads are booming. Uh, it's, it's a catalyst. Uh, you go down to Herndon, uh, their terminus for the Washington and Old Dominion or Purcellville. There are restaurants with bikes outside. Uh, Alexandria, Old Town Alexandria, bikes everywhere. Um, so it, it, it really is a good draw. And you look at the look at the restaurants at the uh, at the end of the Western Maryland Rail Trail. Uh, w without the bikes there, they'd be hurt um, during the summer. So they, uh, th there's th it, it is a catalyst, and as you pointed out, uh, drawing people downtown. Or it, it's a real it's a real opportunity for people who want to live in Hagerstown to have that kind of resource right there in their backyard. So. I, I think it's, uh, I, I support uh, 
what you're asking for. I'm okay. with a letter of support as well. And I am too, but I also completely agree with everything uh, that our councilman has said. I completely agree with Austin. I have ridden many of those trails also and have found the same thing. My only question is one, um, how do you handle the active rail line? Like I said, with the rail, the um, railroad trail ride there, I showed you the two photographs of active tracks um, with the trail next to them, and they work very well. Okay. A number of states, there hasn't been problems I'm aware of, and there's still a viable way to do a trail when you have the active tracks. That's the, fine. I'm the, just uh, curious. The York, uh, York Rail Trail has the same thing with a, an active trail. Good. Never, I don't think there's ever been any any issues there good no I totally support it mr. Wood I'm in support also I rode for the first time on the Western Maryland bike trail this weekend after years of begging my husband oh, to go wonderful. so it was it was awesome <laughs> um, and what a great time for you to be able to present this with the you know with COVID and everyone <clears throat> wanting to do more outdoor activities and be on the bikes and on the you know whatever they can do on the, the trail so I also am in support of the letter so thank you for bringing it to our attention one thing I can add as a guide at Antietam is we get a fair amount of business of people on the trail from Pittsburgh mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. DC and, and vice versa they uh, they love stopping by the battlefield and doing like a three-hour tour yep. so it has definitely increased our business Buddy Lou's was packed. Oh, yeah. All right, we'll put together a letter of, uh, of support. Thank you, Chip. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll send a copy to the county. Oh, just so they know. Oh, so Uh, before we go forward with this uh, annexation of Valley Mall Road properties again, uh, I want to let you know we're taking number eight off the Alexander House commercial space for innovation project for this evening, and we'll talk about that at another time. All right, Megan, one more time. Mr. Mayor, without full council during this discussion. I mean, I would like to suggest moving it to, this is a, I think this is an important topic and an important discussion that we should have full participation. It's just my opinion. Agreed. I don't have a problem with that, given the fact that there's no emergent issue here. And there's a vote on it later. I know it's one more week. I'm sorry. And that's just my opinion. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see you guys next week on this one. Megan, you can stay there and talk about Thomas Bennett Hunter. Sure. So the other annexation we're here to talk about is uh, Thomas Bennett Hunter and other lands. Um, this is another pre-annexation agreement that the city activated. This one's from 2015. Um, it's a total of 21.15 acres, and it also includes a portion of Halfway Boulevard right-of-way and the CSX right-of-way. Um, county zoning is HI and IG, um, Industrial General, and the proposed city zoning is also IG. Um, we had the public hearing on uh, July 28th. Um, we haven't had any public input aside from Maryland Department of Planning's letter, which I think you guys received at the hearing, um, essentially just states that they agree the uh, zoning is consistent. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for that one. And I think we have a hearing scheduled for August. So that pre-annexation agreement will signed in 15? Oh, yeah, approval is scheduled for the end of August. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah the pre-annexation agreement was signed in 15, right? Uh, yeah, 2015 07 was the case number. Any questions for Megan? No. No. I guess we'll make a determination months from now on this, apparently. <laughs> so thank you, guys. We'll put it up for a vote at the end of this month, anyway. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, 
All right, street closures for outdoor dining. Good afternoon. We're here tonight to talk about um, street closures, specifically the unit block of South Potomac Street uh, to accommodate outdoor dining in response to the COVID crisis. And for background, we um, did a street closure on Saturday, June 13th. And the street closure was from 3 p.m. to 9.30 in order to facilitate outdoor dining from 4 to 9 p.m. So some points of consideration as we um, discuss this tonight is a similar format recommended to that June 13th event uh, with business responsibilities being communicating to us um, participation and uh, number of tables layout and for restaurants to fully staff and manage their outdoor dining area provide their own tables and chairs uh, do the setup and control alcohol according to liquor board requirements the city would be responsible for setup and takedown of the barricades and also traffic control signage equipment and also communicating traffic advisories for each event. Um, some additional points of consideration as our logistics committee met to discuss this since last week. Um, the fire department recommends this format of closing and barricading the entire street to assure the safety of the patrons um, and the uh, idea of um, parklets is not recommended by the fire department that the tables and chairs would be set up um, in such a way that would maintain an emergency fire lane of uh, one lane wide um, and so no through traffic through the event area but maintaining an emergency fire lane only for emergency vehicles um, we have a need to gather input in, in order to have uh, full feedback on this proposal. We've done some of that and Caitlin will talk about that. Um, and then um, also the idea that downtown restaurants not located in the unit block of South Potomac Street, certainly through our marketing and promotion of a program could continue to uh, promote takeout orders for customers. And I think we're very fortunate in Hagerstown to have the public space that we have with University Plaza and the Cultural Trail. So really using those assets as a location for uh, outdoor dining through takeout orders. Um, we've put forward two options to consider. One is a Saturday in the same format as was done on June 13th, a Saturday from 3 to 9.30. The second option would be Sunday to attract a brunch crowd. Um, I think the second option has a lot of merit um, and potential closure from 9.30 to 4. Um, slight correction in the memo that would, giving an hour of setup time would allow for five hours between 10.30 and 3.30 for outdoor dining. That also could um, be compressed as an additional option uh, for a four hour window, possibly closing the street at 1030 and having the outdoor dining be between 1130 and 330, capturing those that may be coming out of downtown churches and looking for uh, dining opportunities. We also recommend consideration of a fourth Saturday or a fourth Sunday program that could be cross-marketed with the Imagine Hagerstown program that is running on a fourth Friday series. So uh, members of our event logistics committee are here tonight. Um, we're here to participate in the conversation and to uh, seek your direction on next steps. I'll let Caitlin run through some of the feedback we had from businesses in the South Potomac Street Block. Sure, so we did hear some feedback last week when we had the curbside parking discussion, but after a new email to South Potomac businesses and restaurants, I'm still waiting some feedback. However, I have heard from Bisfa and Bridge of Life who are both saying that they very much support the street closure. 
they're not afraid of it impacting any of their events, any of their parking, um, any of their church services, and are more than willing to support the community and their neighbors in any way that they can, even through additional marketing. Um, previously, as we discussed last week, Jay, Je Jay Zuspan of 28 South and Bulls and Bears said he would more than welcome a closure um, for any amount of dates. And he had spoke with CNO Taco and the Art Gastro Pub. I have not heard from them specifically yet, but in his discussion, they did seem interested in all chipping in for a musician to play on South Potomac as well, so that indicates that they would be interested as well. Um, and when the Dog House restaurant is up and running, he is also very supportive. I think um, a discussion next with them would be, are they okay with any impact that might affect the curbside parking with the street shutdown? But so far, those are the opinions that I've heard regarding businesses and restaurant feedback on South Potomac. Did they have a, an opinion as to which day that they, did they mention that? They had no opinion. I know when I talked to Jay, he did mention that he'd be willing to do a Friday, Saturday, or a Sunday. Um, I know he has a great brunch crowd, and I know um, I've emailed the stew hoping that they would love to put in their brunch time as well. So my thought is it's already August 11th. And quite frankly, it's going to start getting cold out in October. I think we really only have the remainder of August and September to, to really get a big crowd. So why don't we do a Saturday and then the following Sunday and then the following Saturday and the following Sunday? Because that, just say we even started next Saturday the 22nd, that leaves Sunday the 30th. Saturday the 5th, Sunday the 13th, and Saturday the 26th. It's, it's, there's still only five or six dates that we could do it. And then it accompanies the Saturday night crowd three times or four times, and then a brunch crowd three times or four times. And then we'd have to go from the, you know, see how the weather is. Because I know once it gets chilly out, people probably aren't going to want to sit outside at 7 o'clock at night either. I'm definitely in favor of it on an alternating week. I, I'm not interested in a just a once a month. I don't think that that's helping as much as we can. I think that to be consistent in a, a weekly basis is much more, much more of an opportunity for the downtown businesses. Once a month is tough. Yeah, I agree too that there's a, I was looking at the calendar uh, just uh, this morning and trying to figure out, you know, when is the, one of the leaves turning, one's, uh, it's, it's coming quick. Yeah. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. almost here. So I think as, as much uh, relief as we can give the restaurants now, um, we, should, we should take advantage of the warmer weather and, yeah. and, and do it. Um, and I, I think you know, everybody can figure out how to deal with a, a road closure and get around. It's not that big a, not that big an inconvenience to, to get around that, that, air, that block. If we can survive one lane for in front of the Maryland Theater for that long a time, I think yeah. that this is, this is a piece of cake. I think so. Well, I guess it's all going to depend on what the how the restaurants feel about that kind of schedule, too. It's a pretty aggressive schedule. And maybe they'll do it one time and realize that, you know, it's not worth it to them. I don't know. But I would leave it up to them to, to kind of come back and give us a I don't think we have time to keep going back for direction. I don't though. think, I think so it's, either, it's already I mean, halfway through August. If they put together August. a schedule and put it out there, and then they say that they don't want to do it, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't force them to partake. I mean, you can close the street down anytime you want to, but you can't force yeah. them to partake. Is what I'm saying. It's also going to take a little while for the public to catch on. You know, it's it's an unusual, it's an unusual gesture. So um, it's just going to take a little while. So it's not going to happen. You know, the first two weeks, we're just going to have this mass amount of crowd down there. But and I'm I mean, I'm, I'm a, listen, you guys know I'm in favor of closing the street down every weekend. I know, weekend. I don't forever. <laughs> so, I mean, you know. But I also know that restaurants are going to gauge what's like, even if they do it twice and they realize that maybe it's it's not working for them. But I, again, I, anything we can do, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor. But I think we ought to just make sure that we're in constant contact with get their feedback and know whether or not we're going to make this 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 change to our to our streets between now and, and, and the end of September and whether or not they're going to partake that's all uh, 
I mean, go ahead and schedule the first first time. I mean, do it, you know, and then let's let's make sure that we're we're getting our feedback. I'm hoping to hear from restaurants tomorrow. Um, Public Works and Parking Department have been helping us since last Tuesday, and we are looking to have signs put up tomorrow, um, as long as the weather stays fair. And I will be sending out a social media blast and a letter to businesses again saying the signs are up, here are the location, and I hope to get feedback to see if they find curbside parking on Fridays or Saturdays or Sundays more beneficial or less beneficial than a street closure would be. Because I don't know if they're going to be facing a lot more popularity with curbside pickup on a Friday night than they would with people dining. So I hope to get feedback on that as well. And so the, the spaces designated in the first block of South Potomac for curbside parking would be impacted by the street cl closure, of course. So, right. And just to repeat back the um, direction, uh, is a Saturday closure, the following week a Sunday closure, the next week a, su a Saturday closure, the next week a Sunday closure, that type of alternating yeah. pattern? That's what I think we should do. And then if it doesn't work, we can adjust moving forward. If no one shows up for brunch for two weeks in a row, we'll just adjust. I think at that point, it's on what's working best for the restaurants. Yeah, they may have a preference as to, I mean, because that's a lot. I mean, the mayor's right, you know, going back and forth and back and forth may well, be a little challenging also. What? Can, can you say that again? I will admit when you're right, it's, it's rare, but I'll admit it when it happens. Um, but I do think that, you know, as a, as a business owner, you know, going back and forth and adjusting that and getting your patrons to, to catch on and such like that might be a little challenging. Um, I do know that Cannon Coffee, one of their core values is to not be open on Sunday. So they're not going to want to participate on Sunday because it's time with their family. So, um, you know, that's just something to consider that, you know, they're, they're a staple down there on the corner, very visual, and if they're closed, then... Um, you know, we may want to start out on a Saturday and then flip it to a Sunday the next week, if that's something that the restaurants, and I know that you're in contact with them, so. And you never know, I mean, when you, when you begin a schedule, sometimes people catch on the schedule, and, you know, maybe even next year when COVID's not the reason why, we can have that same kind of schedule. Yeah. And, and, and have, you know, some great times in, in, in our streets. So. And you've mentioned, do you have contacted up here, like, Gourmet Goat and Hannah Tai and such like that and gotten some feedback from them as well. Yeah, the feedback I received um, from businesses not on South Potomac was from Pretzel Pizza and they acknowledged that they aren't part of it. They'd be happy to try to arrange extra seating in University Plaza, but they know it doesn't affect them. They're in favor of it for other businesses, but know that they are likely not going to get much participation out of that at all. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. City Administrator? I got nothing to nightmare. Kristen? Oh. Awesome. Nothing to nightmare. <laughs> Emily? Nothing. Yeah, no, that's why Luke go last. Go ahead. Michelle. Nothing this evening. Luke? Thank you, Mayor. Um, and obviously, I do have something to say tonight. Uh, we lost a, uh, Hagerstown lost a wonderful person last week. Bill Brickner is someone who you could sort of call Mr. Hagerstown. Uh, I was very lucky. I was appointed to the council in 1994, and Bill was on the council at the time. He was one of the folks that appointed me, and I was lucky enough to serve the balance of his 16 years on the council and his four years as mayor with him. Um, and there are nothing but wonderful things I could say about Bill Brickner. <clears throat> Without getting into a lot of detail, um, I guess my one story is, for things I won't go into, but pre-1994, uh, Bill Brickner would have had reasons maybe not to like me so much. Um, when I came up in front of the council in 94 for the appointment, Bill was a strong <coughs> supporter and within 48 hours of that appointment, I spent a solid eight hours in the car with Bill, driving around this entire city with Bill, pointing out this and that and this and that, and made me very knowledgeable about things that I had no idea about in this city. And he could not have been a kinder human being to me and everybody I have known uh, in my career than Bill Bruckner was. 
He was as knowledgeable as could be. And the only thing that I can say that rates right up with Bill was his wife, Jan, who was the same type of quality person. Bill will be missed by everybody. Uh, and I say 16 years on the council, four years as the mayor, the first city administrator we had in Hagerstown. And what a difference for those who know the history of the city of Hagerstown government when the charter was amended after the 81 election to provide for a city administrator government. It could have gone in a lot of different directions, but under the leadership of Bill, it went the right way. And we now only have our, what, our fourth city administrator now. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I would say is I would make a recommendation to this body. Um, we have Memorial Park, and nobody gets inscribed in that Hall of Fame unless they've been deceased for 20 years. And I'm not suggesting that we should make any change to that policy. What I am suggesting, however, is maybe I'm missing some folks. I hope not, and apologize if I do. <clears throat> but in the year since we have created that Hall of Fame in that park, I can't think of anybody more deserving to have their name inscribed there than Bill Brickner during this time frame. So I would urge us to make a new category on that Hall of Fame, and that just be those people that whatever current council was in existence at the time, thinks need to be emblazoned on that list to be considered in 20 years. I would like to know that somebody would remember that name needs to be under consideration and not wait 20, 25 years for another body who may see nothing but a picture there to come up with a name. So that would be my suggestion. Uh, for the minimum for us to try to honor Bill to get his name on that list for consideration. Uh, thank you, Mary. That's all. Thank you. Um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on Lou. Uh, Bill and I uh, got along actually famously uh, for the entire time that I was mayor and he was on the council. And uh, we, we, we both supported, uh, you know, the city of Hagerstown in every fashion. And, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, he was the guy that I would go to to ask things about because of his history. Um, you know, we had wonderful staff, but heck, Bill had been along, around longer than any of them uh, when I became mayor. So, uh, you know, I looked to him a lot. And uh, as, I, as I said in my, uh, in my Facebook page, uh, post, we lost a great patriarch because that's what he was for us. He was the father figure of the council for years, and uh, we looked up to him, and, and, and he brought a history to that council table that uh, was unmatched. So uh, he's going to be sorely missed. And Lou, I agree that we should in some way, um, you know, make a record that his name be, a, you know, be a, a suggested 20 years from now. So um, it'll be missed greatly. He was a great man and I enjoyed him. So with that, we're adjourned. See you next week. <laughs>